Welcome again to Biblical Life TV. Today we're going to be getting into Remnant Boot Camp number three. And we've been going through 1 John. And I want to pick up again in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. In fact, verse 1, at least the first part of it, you need to underline in your Bible where he says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. Hmm. That you sin not. You know, even by the time of the Apostle John, Gnostics and those untrained in Torah were already trying to redefine or dismiss the commandments of God and to eliminate the concept of sin. Seems to me like they've taken a playbook, a page out of the playbook of a lot of preachers today. You see, if we say that there is no sin, then Jesus didn't need to die on the cross. That there's no need to repent. There's no need to accept him as our Lord and Savior. There's no need to do anything if, all, if there's no such thing as sin. Yet Jesus himself said, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot nor tittle will be passed away from the word of God until all be fulfilled. And let me tell you something. All isn't fulfilled until you get to the very last chapter, the very last verse of the book of Revelation. All has not been fulfilled. And so here we are. He's, he's preparing the church to, to uh, the remnant to come into that time where the book of Revelation is unfolding. And he says, listen, the reason that I'm telling this to you is so that you don't sin. It seems to me like he was concerned about sin, and he was concerned about how the enemy would work uh, in opening the door to sin. We need to understand that when we sin, that gives us access to the, uh, the, the, gives the devil access to us. It gives the spirit of error access to us. It gives the the spirit of Antichrist access to us. You know, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 13 through 14, it says, There hath no temptation take you such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not subject or not suffer you to be attempted above what ye are able that will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And then he, fin- he, he finishes that, says, Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. There's several things that we need to understand about sin. Number one, Satan has a limited bag of tricks. He cannot come up with something that we have never found before in the Word of God. Well, oh, Yeah. How about him coming up with all this transhumanist stuff and going with human 2.0 and creating these people that are like demigods is what they're envisioning in the transhumanist movement. Been there, done that, already bought the t-shirt. It's called Genesis chapter 6. He's facilitating it with with another methodology, but it's the same lie. It's the same thing. He has to use science. Because when, when God, when, when the canopy broke and we had the flood on the earth, it changed part of the physiology of man. Man quit living to be almost a 1,000 years old, and it was restricted to 120. And there were a lot of physiological changes that happened on the inside of man that also uh, stopped the fallen angels from breeding with humans. And so now they're having to, they had to get mankind to the place where we had the scientific methods to replace or overcome what God did when he established uh, the, 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 all the changes because literally the atmosphere of the planet is different than it was in Adam's day. When that canopy broke, it changed everything. And that has been demonstrated with scientific uh, data that has come out of the creationists too. They've actually created a sphere that they can recreate the atmospheric conditions that were there before the flood. You take snake venom and you put it in there like with a rattlesnake, and if you ever look under a microscope, the, the, uh, the venom itself looks almost like chaotic under the microscope. You put them in that atmosphere and it's no longer poisonous, and when you put it underneath the microscope, it's all in order. 
There's, there's some things that God did. So, I mean, no matter how sci-fi you want to get, it's not outside the range of the Word of God. And there's nothing new under the sun, just like Solomon said. And Satan has a, has a very limited bag of tricks. And so what he gets us to do is he says, listen, forget what God's word says about sin. There is no sin. That's no longer sin now because of the cross. Because if you're, com- if you're under the blood and you're walking with God the way that you're supposed to, he cannot find an open door to get access to your life. And since God has put this limitation on him, his only option is to get us to redefine what sin is, to do away with parts of the word of God that begin tearing down our walls of protection. And then he has access to us. Now, if you, if you look at what is here in first Corinthians he says he said now listen there's there's no temptation that's not common to man that he can use but with every temptation he gives a way of escape how many know that's the job of the Holy Spirit working in your life but look what he ends it with and flee from idolatry because all sin will lead to idolatry when it has its work Well, you mean somebody's going to set up a statue and begin worshiping it in their home? No. They say that that sin that God said was sin is no longer sin, and they violate the word of God by setting that thing up as an idol in their life and says, I can do that regardless of what God says. And they use the cross as an excuse to do it. That's why as he's preparing the remnant for the book of Revelation, he said, all this I'm writing is so that you don't sin. We need to return to biblical holiness once again. That's not being taught very, very much. In fact, the sure way to absolutely lose all your viewers is to start preaching biblical holiness in this day and this hour. All you're going to end up with is the remnant that is hungry for the truth. But he goes on to say in, in, in 1 John 1 and, uh, 2 and 1, he says, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I like the way he put that. Jesus Christ, the only righteous one. The one who walked the ways of God and the Torah God and never sinned, although the word tells us in the book of Hebrews is that he was tempted with every temptation that we could have. He, he understood it, even to the point of getting in the flesh and getting angry about something. They had, we read in the word that they had killed his cousin John by an evil king because that king was lusting after, after his own, uh, own flesh, if you will, and killed John to shut him up. Jesus goes to be alone. The people come up and instead of him, how many know that he could have caused a revolt right there in Judea? Not against Rome, He could have caused one right there about, the, about, about their, their, uh, their vessel king that they had under Caesar. He could have absolutely caused a revolt. Instead, he, he ministered in love and began ministering to the people. He had the absolute right to react and get in the flesh, yet he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Instead, he, he, God gave him a way out of that temptation by responding in love. He understands. That's why he is the advocate for us. Now, this word advocate in in the Greek is parakletos, which is a little bit different than parakletos, that we get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one called alongside that comforts, that mentors, and gently corrects. Parakletos also has, he is one summoned alongside, called to aid one, but it's he's there to plead your case before a judge. There is a, it's almost, it's almost like if, if you were on trial today, you have the prosecuting attorney, because when you really look at it, the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. You have God the judge. You have Satan being the prosecuting attorney says, I have a right to do this in your life because you violated this and you violated this and you violated this because you violated God's word that I caused you to violate because I tricked you in saying that they're obsolete no longer for today, that it gives me right to do things in your life. And that, but yet if I repent, I have an advocate, I have my own attorney. I have my own attorney, Jesus Christ the righteous, which begins pleading my case not based upon what I've done, but upon his blood that covered that sin. 
if I'll come under it. That's the, if is a, you know, if may be a real small word, but in reality, it's a very, very, very big word. It's a very big word. If I'll come under that, then he can plead my case and say, you know, the devil, yeah, you tricked him into doing this, but he's already brought that underneath the blood. Because just as John had said last week in, in, in the first chapter, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess them to him. He's faithful and just. Forgiveness of sin doesn't matter on the fact whether you feel like you've been forgiven or not. Have any of us have feelings that have been out of line with reality a time or two in our life? Or maybe 50, 60, 70% of the time, unless we're being led by the Holy Spirit. You can have the grief and realization that you sinned, and the devil's beating you over the head saying, you don't deserve forgiveness, but if you really ask Jesus to forgive you and really mean it from your heart, the word says, I don't care what you feel. He's faithful and just, not based upon your feelings, but upon, upon him, his faithfulness. He does it. And now he's saying, listen, if we do sin, you see, not only can he forgive us, but now he's going to stand beside us as a paracletos, as, 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 as an attorney that can stand beside us saying, judge, I've got it covered. I've got it covered. He's come underneath my righteousness. He's come underneath my blood. He's come underneath my ways. And that's so important for us to understand. How many know God has a system that if we will work with the system, that system will work? But we've got to stay within the confines of that which Almighty God has done. Let's go on to verse 2 here. For he is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the entire world. Now, for some of us, propitiation is a big word that nobody ever bothers to define. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'll take apart the little words, but I really go after the big words. What does propitiation mean? In the Greek, it is helasmos, which means an appeasing and appeasing. In fact, it can also be defined in the Encyclopedia of the Bible as a turning away of anger by the offering of a gift. Now, evangelical ministers really have a hard time when you look at theologically, they have a hard time at the selection of this word because it is used quite a bit in paganism. Have you ever seen the old uh, the old jungle movies where the volcano's going off and they think that God is angry at them, so they grab some young virgin to go up and to throw her into the fire to, to, to appease the, the anger of the gods or whatever it might be. And that's use, But we, we need to understand paganism got that from somewhere. They got that concept for somewhere. Paganism, a lot of times, will use the concept of blood covenant. That does not mean it did not originate with God. We need to understand that, that by, by the Apostle John using this word, and it's also used by the Apostle Paul in very key scriptures, especially in Romans and other places, where it deals with the forgiveness of sin, sin causes anger in the heart of God. It did before the cross, and it did after the cross. Sin always causes anger. And when Jesus, he became our propitiation on the cross, not only do we see the sin of all mankind in one place at one time manifested on him in the flesh, we see the wrath of God poured on him of all the, of all the wrath for, from Adam to the very last Joe that walks this earth, that all the wrath of God was poured out at one moment on Jesus on the cross. That's why uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Flavius, or Flavius Josephus, get it there in a minute. That's what happens when you get old, you don't always have all your notes. He, he said that literally Jesus, when he was on the cross, was reduced basically to raw hamburger between the beatings. And can you imagine... All of that being poured out at one place. That's what it means about propitiation, the gift needed. The wrath of God had to be settled somewhere, and it was channeled in one place in time and space and landed on Jesus on the cross. So that he, the gift that he gave us turns the anger of God away from us. 
You see, it's not just about having an open door to Satan. It's also about having not having the wrath of God poured on us. What does not come and remain under the blood is tagged for the wrath of God. That is a biblical fact. Open the book of Revelation. Now, we need to understand a couple of things that, that, well, doesn't God love everybody? Yes, he does. Does God want everybody to be saved? Absolutely. Well, that's why this thing is being drawn out for 2,000 years after the cross. It's because of the stupidity of man and the hard, hardness of men's hearts that God keeps drawing this thing out. Trying, well, maybe eventually I'm going to try to get all those that will be saved. I want, to get, I want them to get saved. But all of us realize if you've ever dated before you got married and you have just fell in love with somebody and they did not reciprocate that love. In fact, not only was that love not reciprocated, but they began rejecting your love and turned into your very enemy. Eventually, you got to cut them loose and let them go. That's the book of Revelation. I made a propitiation for your sin I poured all my wrath there, but since you won't come under that gift and you've rejected everything about me, then you've rejected the, the gift that appeased the wrath. And therefore, the wrath was only placed at that one place for the remnant that have come under that covenant and come under that blood and walk with me. And therefore, by rejecting my love, the only thing you have left is my wrath. That's why there is a designation in the book of Revelation when they get to that seventh bowl. Here is where there are the seventh trumpet. Right here is where the wrath of God begins, and it's seven bowls of wrath. Why seven? Because it is wrath perfected. Wrath perfected. That because you wouldn't accept Jesus taking the wrath of God for you, now you're going to have all the, all the wrath that God has been storing up since Adam is going to be poured out on mankind in seven events that bring wrath to its perfection. Hmm. How many are glad this morning that he is your propitiation for your sin? He, he, he was that gift that, that was our propitiation. You said, Mike, I just don't... I just don't believe that. Without, without, not the way everybody's preaching. Well, I'm, I'm leaving my notes, so can we do this just for a second? I want to see if I can go here in the book of Revelation. And I've got a brand new Bible, so nothing is marked. <laughs> in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to the idols and to commit fornication. We read over that, but we never go back and fully read the story of Balaam. Balaam was paid by Balak to curse the children of Israel. He went up the first time, couldn't do it. Went up another time, and instead of a curse coming out of his mouth, the most beautiful blessing that was ever spoken over the children of Israel come out of his mouth. How many know that was one shock prophet? In fact, that is such a beautiful blessing that in, in synagogues every Sabbath, that those words that came out of Balaam's mouth is, is proclaimed every Sabbath. It's read. How beautiful are your tents? <laughs> and so he had the event, we all know about the talking donkey saying, are you stuck on stupid Balaam? There's an angel going to kill you if you try to utter this against God's people. And so he went back, and and Balak said, you know what? I'm going to offer you more money because obviously what you're doing is you're drawing this thing out to get more money. So I'm going to to offer you more money. What are we going to do? And he said, what we've got to do is we've got to get the children of Israel to begin violating the commandments of God. 
I can't curse them as long as they're walking in covenant with God and they're being obedient to him. But if I get them to begin violating parts of his covenant, God's hands begin to to lift off of them, which is the open door. But if they continue, then his wrath will begin poured on them because they're violating covenant. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is warning us about that same tactic. One of the reasons why America is being attacked from all sides the way that it is today is the church has abandoned the covenant. And the apostle John is saying, these things I write to you that you sin not, America. Because not only are you opening the door to the enemy, you're about, if you continue on this and teach others to do the same thing, The doctrine of Balaam is beginning to go forth in America and it's going to cause the wrath of God to be poured out. Now let me tell you something. In America, we have not seen the wrath of God with anything that has gone on worldwide yet. All we've had were... (laughs) Knock, knock, Neo. (laughs) You want to find out what's going on in the Matrix? You want to find out what's really going on? Knock, knock. I am a holy God, and you have set up idols and even put my name on them. Isn't that what Israel did over and over again? Even with a golden calf, they said that this is Yahweh. How many know that God was not very pleased with that at all? And he's not pleased with a lot of things that are going on in America today, things that are being not only preached in the secular world, but is being preached over the Christian airwaves, taken away from the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, and the commandments of God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now let's go to the litmus test here in 1 John 2, 3 through 6. This is a litmus test for the remnant. Because I'm not preaching to churchianity anymore. All I'm interested in is empowering the remnant. Because the remnant are going to be the ones who make it to the end. The remnant are going to be the ones that are the, that bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's what I'm worried about. I'm tired. You know, if you've got to convince somebody that says they follow Jesus and say that this is the word of God, and then they spend 90% of the time giving you excuses why they don't have to do it anymore, and even use the cross as an excuse, then you don't understand the cross and you don't understand the word of God. And here's the litmus test according to the Apostle John. And hereby we know that we know him if we go to church every Sunday. Hereby we know we know him because we put this this smile on our face and we get Holy Ghost goosebumps at least twice a week. If we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. You see, in the heart of a believer... Once you're saved, you want to do what God says to do in his word. It takes a theologian and a preacher to teach you to disobey what's in your heart. How many people have I gotten letters from that that get saved and they start opening up the Bible and they'll start from the beginning of the book? Isn't that natural? Every once in a while you get one that gets really woolly and they start the book of Revelation. They go... (gasps) (laughs) Start at the beginning of the book. And they read, I'm not supposed to do this. Well, okay, I won't do this. The preacher says, why aren't you doing this? Well, we don't do that anymore. You know, that's this Jewish stuff. And you're not a Jew. Don't do that anymore. You know, I don't think that would have flew very well in the, in the face of the Apostle Paul or Johnny the One. I think they would have taken it about this much. The only problem with any of the Torah that the Apostle Paul had was requiring circumcision of the flesh for Gentiles. That's the only thing. That was the reason for the council being convened in in, in Acts chapter 15. That was it, and they dealt with no other issues. And they said, listen, give the boys a chance to learn Moses. In fact, the command is learn Moses every week. But the, the heart of someone truly born again is to get in here and begin finding out what God says to do and start doing it and find out what God doesn't like and quit doing that. 
That, that's the Holy Spirit working on the inside of them, and we've got to give them some theological gymnastic excuses to get them to not do it. That's why, that's why the apostle of love, John is the apostle of love. You know, sometimes if, you're, if, the, if you love the most, you're also the straightest shooter. When it, when it comes down to where you're, you're, in a, you're in a situation that's very dangerous, you don't pussyfoot around, you go right to it. You know, it's like if you if you love a kid and they're on the edge playing almost on the edge of where the street is and there's a car racing, you don't try to coax them in with a cookie. You'll grab them by the hair if you have to and pull them out of the way of that car. That's what the Apostle John is doing here. Listen, hereby we know that you're remnant material if you keep the commandments. That is straight and to the point and about as blunt as you can get it. Then he goes on, he that saith, I know him, and keep not his commandments is a what? Is a liar, and the truth isn't in him. I mean, he, he went from blunt to slap you upside the head. We need to understand that the, the, the blood of Jesus and the commandments of Jesus are going to have to be paramount in our theology in these end times. You got to live a life that's lined up with the blood. And the only way to live a life that's lined up with the blood is to line up with the word. And it's amazing. People say, well, you know, he was talking about the New Testament commandments. Everybody heard that? You know, Jesus was talking about all the commandments. See, the New Testament didn't exist when this Jewish boy wrote 1 John. It was not canonized until a couple of hundred years later. But what had been canonized is Genesis through Malachi, the Tanakh. And so this Jewish boy was pointing back to Moses and was saying, if you know him, those are the commandments that you keep. Now they have to be kept through the matrix of who Jesus is. When you look at the 613 commandments of Torah, one half of them are about, about the sacrifices. How many know Jesus was the perfect sacrifice? So we can kind of say, you know, this as long as we, we look at those to see what Jesus has done for us, it might even be what, what is required of us. Like an offense offering, if I, if, if I would have an offense against Pastor Rodhouse, I can't just go to the altar and, and, and give that offering. I'm required by Torah to go make it right with him before I give the offering. There's a lot of wisdom in that. How many people, before they would ask God to forgive them or go back to church, would go and make something right that they had done the week before, maybe even the last we, you know, during the last service, something they said that really hurt somebody. What would happen if you understood the commandments of God that you're really not supposed to come back before the altar of God until you go and make that thing right? There would not be feuds that lasted for 10, 20, 30 years in a church or tear a church apart. Here in our local area, we had one church that was thriving, built a new building, and there was a division because of something somebody did, and I don't know all the particulars of it, but the next thing you know, the church went back to the bank. And that church just kind of blew up in about 10 different directions. That's the flesh that did that. I don't care what the, what the reason was. There was the flesh that did that, and because they did not understand the Torah and the way God talks about things, it opened the door for the devil to go right in there and tear that thing apart. We need, to be, we need to be cognizant of what God's word teaches. Then he goes on, he says, listen, he's not, and the truth is not in him. If you really have the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done for you, your heart will respond by getting into the word and doing what the word says to do. If you're constantly figuring out ways around it, I propose to you that you have not completely yielded to the cross and you're trying to get in another way. A little bit of Jesus, a little bit of me, and a little bit of twisted logic. The only way to come under the blood is you've got to completely yield to him. That's the only way. But let's, let's go on what he picks up here in verse 5. He says, but whosoever keepeth his word, now noticing he is equating his word with his commandments. They're one and the same. So anybody today says they're a word person, that word better start in Genesis 1, not Matthew 1. Or he, he does not line up with the Apostle John. 
Whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Well, I want to go back and do something. I just, well, it's amazing what you see when you actually go back and look down at your notes. It's just something preachers do, I guess. But he says, he says now, if, if I know him, if I keep his commandments, and I want to show you where this open door is, I want to go to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. I believe the, the Apostle Paul, or the Apostle John, in 1 John warns there are many antichrists already in the world. We need to understand that antichrist system originated in Babylon. And it went from Babylon to the Persians and the Medes, to the Greeks and then to the Romans, and to the Romans, and it was manifested in the, even in the Roman Catholic Church that what their, their take on it was that the church has the authority to change the laws of God into something else. So it's not, so from a Catholic point of view, now us Protestants, we try, oh no, the, 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 the commandments of God have been done away with at the cross. We're coming in on the backside of an argument that we didn't even know existed. The Catholic Church said that they had the authority because Christ, because God had, be, Jesus had, had basically won. And they almost pulled in this Marcionistic type of, of doctrine that Marcion, after he, you know, he, he was the first one to say, listen, the Old Testament's for the Jews, the, the writings of Paul are for the Gentiles. And, and he was rejected at Antioch and cast out, called the firstborn son of Satan. How, how's that for a church meeting? That later on in his life, he said, listen, there are really two gods. There was Yahweh Elohim in the Old Testament. He was an evil, dark God. Then Jesus came along and conquered him. We, we don't necessarily articulate that in our theology, but we, 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 we allude to it. Although right now there, are, there is a Pentecostal denomination that is literally saying those very words, that Yahweh of the Old Testament was an evil God and that Jesus beat him. Not knowing that in Yahweh is encoded who Jesus really is. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus is the one who gave the commandments to Moses and met with him face to face. But look here at what we, we find out about the Antichrist. And it says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High God and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. He changes laws and times. That's the platform of that has already been set up. But one of the words that you need to underline in your Bible is think. Because I don't think he's I don't think he's referring to international law. Now, you know, if if the entire world went into Sharia law, which is what Islam's all about, when the Mahdi comes, that they're going to change all international law. In fact, we have one man right now that's, that uh, works for our current president. I just read the report on it this week that he's, a, he's a kind of in charge of religious freedom, whatever, the, whatever that means anymore. And he has said that Sharia is superior to the American Constitution and American law. So if you had, let's say, let's say the, the, there, there is a prophetic possibility that when the Mahdi comes, that he will be the Antichrist, what we would consider the Antichrist. And he changes all the, all the world to come under Sharia law. In a sense, that would be changing the times and the laws. But laws are changed all the time. There are international law. There are treaties that, there are, we already have treaties today that, that supplant the, the, the Constitution of the United States that we've already made with other nations. But he thinks that he has changed them, and it can only refer to the laws and the times of God. He has replaced them with something else. So the spirit of Antichrist that Daniel warned about was, was already manifested in 325 A.D. and began the process of, of saying, listen, we can change the laws of God. We say now we have the authority since the Pope is the, the basically, the, in a sense, the reincarnation, if you will, of Christ. He, although he, he does what Pharaoh did. You have, you have a king of Egypt that goes under this ritual, and he becomes the personification of Osiris. They've taken that pagan thing, and they have made it that way with Jesus, that he's called the vicar of Christ. That means he, he has personified and taken on the role of Jesus in the earth. 
And now he can write all new laws that, that abdicate the laws of God. We now do these holidays, not these times. But from God's perspective, he says he thinks he does because heaven doesn't change. There is only the violation of God's laws and missing God's appointed times. God always shows up regardless of what your calendar says and what you've written down on your calendar as holy days or holidays. God says, you know what? I'm not going to show up to yours because you're not showing up to mine, especially if yours originated in Babylon. And God calls them an abomination. So can I propose to you that one of the reasons, especially in this day and this hour, that so many saints are getting wore out is they've left the times of God and they've left the ways of God. They left the laws of God. They left the times of God. And because that, the Antichrist, because he was able to think that he could change those and get us to think it with him, that it gives him the ability to wear us out. Now, what really gives him the ability to even ex uh, expand that more is when he can get the entire planet to do away with the law of God and the times of God to where it's illegal to do them. Oh, he wouldn't do that. The Pope already has. There, there, there have been decrees over, over three or 400 years after, after 325 that if a Christian was caught doing Passover, he was to be executed. If a Christian was caught doing Sabbath, he was to be executed. You see, what will be has always been it's just it done on steroids when we get to the end. I don't want the Antichrist to have any kind of pull in my life. Therefore, I've got to come under the blood. I've got to come under the ways of God like never before. Past generations may have been able to play with it. Now, they have paid to a certain extent for it. But when you get to the end of the book, everything is amplified. Oh, you're not getting that. The power of the blood is amplified when you get to the end of the book. The power of God's commandments are amplified when you get to the back of the book. The ways of God are more powerful when you get to the back of the end of the book because when push comes to shove, we have what really counts within us. That's why 1 John is so pivotal to prepare you to go into the book of Revelation as we're watching it literally begin to unfold before our eyes. Well, how far away? I don't know. Really, when you look at the book of Revelation, after you get past the seven churches, deals with the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. That's all it deals with. So we don't know how things work up. I still think we have some time left because I'm trying to get the remnant lined up to get ready to go in and not be deceived by what's coming against us. Let's go on here in 1 John 2 and 5. Now it's time to get into, into the verily the love of God is perfected. You see, I want some maturity. I want some maturity in my life. I want some maturity in the life of the believers. Lord knows we need maturity. Let's quit arguing around little, about our little float toys in the kiddie pool and go ahead and get into the deep things of God where things really count. Have you ever seen kids in a kiddie pool? They get into little scuffs about stuff. The reason they get into scuffs about stuff is stuff really doesn't matter in the kiddie pool. Things get serious when you get into deep waters. How many of us, if we can remember far back enough that we can remember when we were in the kiddie pool, we were, we were little kids, that absolutely think if Johnny got my little toy, it is absolutely the end of the world, and I'll not be able to take another breath. I will not be able to live another moment unless I get my toy back. That's all they have reference to. But when you grow up and you put away childish things, that toy meant absolutely nothing. In the grand scheme of things, it meant nothing. Nothing. And a lot of the things that we're squabbling back and forth about in the body of Christ are nothing but a deception and a delusion that we're squabbling over many things that don't really matter so that we miss the grand scale of things and the things that really matter in the kingdom of God. We're more worried 
about making sinners feel at ease in our services than we are the Spirit of God. Last time I checked, if a sinner comes into the presence of God, he should be one squirming bug. Be uncomfortable until he gets right. Otherwise, how's he ever going to repent? The unholy cannot come in contact with the holy without squirming like a, a bug on a hot tin roof. Come on now. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. This word uh, keepeth is taurio, which means to attend to carefully, to guard. Huh. I think that's an interesting word that the Apostle John uses. Because it's reflected in what Adam was supposed to do in the garden. He was supposed to keep and guard the garden. I want you to think about that for a minute. How does this play in with the commandments? He was commanded of God, do not eat of that tree and keep the junk out of the garden. Two basic commandments. And it was the violation of only two commandments that brought sin into the entire world and allowed access for Satan into this earth. Did you know that if Adam would have enforced the commandments that God was given, that gave to him, he would have driven that serpent out of the garden? That serpent got Eve to question not only the commandment of God, but the motivation of God for giving the commandment in the first place. You see, there's a snake trying to get in your garden, trying to get into your life. And if he can get you to question the commandments of God, if he can get you to, com- to, to question the love of God and what the cross was really about and what the shed blood of Jesus is really about, he begins the process of deceiving you to bring ruination to your garden. Therefore, I am required by God to not only do word, but to keep, but to keep the word I've got to guard it to make sure that nothing comes and steals it from me. Any time a spirit comes to you and gets you to start questioning the word of God, it is the spirit of the serpent. The Holy Ghost is not going to come and get you to question what God has written in plain black and white. I saw a cartoon the other day that had this Christian, oh, God, please talk to me. Oh, God, I want you to talk to me. Oh, God, just please talk to me. And the next caption is this big hand coming out of the cloud with a Bible. (laughs) If you won't believe this, what does it matter if the heavens open? And God talks to you. You're going to be like the Jews that were around Jesus when he said, this is my beloved son, hear me him. Some of them heard, and some of them said, whoo, it thundered. Wasn't a cloud in the sky. Did you? They didn't even have sonic booms back then from jets. It just thundered. If you don't align your mind to this, your ears cannot perceive if God would speak anything to you anyway. And why should he waste his time if you won't believe what he put in black and white? If he... This is a supernatural book. It shouldn't even exist today as many people have hated this book and tried to, there were times in in human history this book was illegal to have by penalty of death and they were burned wherever they could find them. And yet we still have this book because God knows that we're going to need it when we get to the end. And why should God tell you anything if you're disobedient about everything he put in black and white? I have found what really gets God to talking is when you start paying attention to this and really start getting into this, wanting to know this and understand this, the Holy Spirit will start talking to you because he's here to teach you this. And when I get really involved in guarding that to make sure that my life doesn't violate what God's word has said, that's when the Holy Spirit says, you know what, I can work with this. I can really work with this. I can do some stuff in your life now. You're not trying to find a theological way of abdicating my commandments and my word. You're trying to find ways of actually doing it to please me because you love me. 
Now that concept's not foreign to any man in this house. When you got married, you had your way of doing things and your wife had her way of doing things. And how many men learned to do things differently because you loved your wife? Okay. And you didn't do them because it was the law. Once you matured a little bit, <laughs> you did them because you actually love your wife. And so when you pick your underwear up off the floor and put them in the hamper, it's a manifestation of your love. Come on. When you come in and you wash your hands and make sure that you're clean and you're not sp spreading germs all over the house, it's a manifestation of your love for your wife. When she decides to have a project, you know, and next thing you know, you're out helping her till and do all these things, it's a manifestation of your love for her. Because you realize the house that she kept clean and the food that she fixed and everything was a manifestation of her love. And so you respond to that love by reciprocating. And how can we not respond to the love of the cross? By finding out what pleases the Father and begin doing those things, not because you're trying to earn his love, but because you've been loved. That's the task of the believer. Now that I am accepted in the beloved, I'm going to find out how the beloved walked because that was completely acceptable to the Father and I choose to be like him. The love of God needs to be perfected in our life. Now the love there, really it's a poor translation to say is this, so I've heard some people say, you know, it, it talks about in Romans that verily the love of God, you know, has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that's not only love for God, but love of God. But this is, this is a love toward God. And he, he could have used one of four words in, in the Greek for love. He could have used phaelo, which talks about brotherly love. We get the word Philadelphia from. Uh, then there's this kind of friend love. Then there's the romantic kind of love. But he used agape in this verse. Now, it's unfortunate that when you look it up, it, it does not mean brotherly love and goodwill. That, that's what Strong's kind of did for that. That's, yeah, but no. When you look at Greek literature of the day, agape was this imagined kind of love, that they, this pure love, this perfect love, this mountain moving kind of perfected love that not that their gods didn't even possess they, they they knew it should be available but i mean if your wife looked too good when you're out working in the field zeus would come and seduce her or cause wars out of this petty arguments between the gods that that was the greco-roman world but yet they had this word that not even their gods could live up to that in the New Testament, that's designated as the love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has for mankind. And he says, you know what? You begin keeping the word and keeping in the commandments because you love God. That supernatural love of God begins to be building in your life. And that love keeps you out of sin. It gets you into that love walk that the devil can't touch. And it says it is perfected now in the Greek that is, that is uh, teleo, which we also get the word teleos from, which means matured. I've seen a lot of believers that, that they abdicate any responsibility for walking in the commandments of God, and the love of God never matures in their life. They end up in the kiddie pool for the rest of their lives. So any spiritual bully that comes around gets them scared and they run off. May I propose to you that while Israel, all the men were hiding in holes because the love of God was not perfected in them, there was a little boy that was, and his name was David. And he didn't get mad because it caused all his brothers to hide in holes. He got mad at Goliath because Goliath dared to make blasphemies against Almighty God. Because he said, who does this uncircumcised Philistine who doesn't have covenant with God think he is that he's making these boasts? You see, love brings real strength. That strength of that love perfected in David is what guided the sling 
and the rock in his hand. You see, what really begins to take new dimensions of spiritual warfare, and I'm going to say this, I have seen a lot of believers over the years, and there have been a few times that I have resembled this as myself, so when you've done it, you can talk about it. I think that I'm this real spiritual warrior, and I, I know biblical kung fu, and I'm just ready to do all this stuff. But yet I got all this sin in my life, and as long as the devil really doesn't show up, I can make believe like I know how to fight. Like little kids, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll watch some cartoon, and you see them out in the yard, hi-ya, 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 whoa, okay. Then they get on the playground, and there's a kid that really knows how to fight, Oh, yeah, folk, uh, and off they go. Run into the teacher, run to mama, because they don't know how to fight. They have no maturity in fighting. They have nothing within them except this little facade that they have built, making everybody think, boy, I can fight, boy, I can fight, boy, I can fight. And I've seen a lot of Christians that way, that when a devil really does show up, they get the snot beat out of them, and they go running off into the woods. And while they're running off in holes, there was this guy that they made fun of forever that was really walking with God because he dared keep the commandments of God. And he's out there saying, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think that he is? And he goes and picks up five rocks and takes up a sling when they're out looking for bazookas and takes the giant down. You see, when I, when I understand the depth of God's love for me, and I understand who I am in him and the importance of the blood of Jesus and keeping a life that lives to honor the blood, that lives to honor the cross, that, learnt, that lives to honor the commandments that God gave us because he gave them to us because he loved us and wanted to keep us safe from the devil. When I begin living a life within those, I learn how to fight and I can move in authority and I can take little things to bring a big devil down. And I'm sure that David didn't shout. David didn't work up the flesh. Have you ever seen some people do spiritual warfare and they end up all red-faced because they're shouting and, and, you know, passing gas and everything else in this whole process, and they call that spiritual warfare, and you get a guy coming in there that really walks with God, he says, that's enough. And the fight's over with. Doesn't raise a hand, raises a finger. That will be enough. The devil, the devil goes, ew. And that presence leaves. It's because fairly in him the love of God has been perfected. It's been matured. And who he is has been matured. And let me tell you something. If you ever get, a, if you ever get an understanding of who you really are in Messiah, if you ever really get an understanding of what that blood has done for you, the commandments become precious and darkness becomes absolute evil and you won't tolerate it. That's how you keep the snake out of the garden. That's how you get the devil pushed out of your life. And that's how you walk in the love of God. Now, I want to end this today with quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6 as part of the Shema. Because how many know this, this Jewish boy that wrote 1 John prayed this portion of Scripture twice a day? It was the watchword for Israel. It was one that was so important that when, when they came to Jesus and said, what's the, what's the most important love of all, or, or law of all, he didn't go to thou shall not commit adultery or thou shall not bear false witness or thou shall not violate the Sabbath. He went to this scripture. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all, and all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you will diligently teach them to your children. That is perfected love in the kingdom of God, that you show God your love by walking in his ways and teaching your children to do the same thing. Why? They become remnant material. That's what I'm after. I no longer, and I, I'm, this is, I'm speaking for this with me just as much as anybody else, I will not tolerate the flesh of Michael Lake trying to come and, and undo or find an excuse not to do something God has said to do. Or get an excuse, it's okay for me to do it. 
You see, this is why the Apostle Paul said, you, you, you need to understand that all this temptation, God gives a way of escape because if you don't, that thing will end up being an idol. Right now, a lot of people have an idol of eating pork. Or they have an idol of doing this, or they have an idol of doing that. Because they say that idol has greater influence in their life than God's Word. And what they've basically done is saying, the snake in the garden I will choose to obey rather than what God has commanded me to do. You can't come up against the Antichrist or the spirit of the Antichrist or the spirit of error and succeed with that in your heart. We've got to learn to combat these things and mature in the things of God. Because I'm going to show him my love for him every time that I'm tempted to sin. I take that sin and I take that attitude and I nail it to the cross. And with every hammer, I love him more than what this flesh would enjoy. I love him more than what this situation would do to my flesh. I love him more and I refuse to do that. I love him more and I'll not let you talk about God light way around me because I love him more than what you think about me. That's maturity. That's what we're after. That's what John was after to instill in all these people because he was writing to the remnant. I've run out of pages. <laughs> Are you guys enjoying this out of 1 John? It's strong me, didn't it? He doesn't mince around. But when the Antichrist really shows up, it's time for strong word. It's more... Uh, appropriate today than it ever has been before. And Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but accomplish where until you have sent it. And Father, I water this word right now with prayer. I ask that the Holy Spirit would cause it to spring up in believers' hearts. And Father, I call for an anointing to activate the remnant anywhere in the earth. Father, the true remnant of God. Father, I loose an anointing to activate their hearts that they'll quit playing church and quit playing religion and quit and start getting in the book and finding out what God has said. And Father, let their heart be, if God says it, that settles it, and they'll long, no longer tolerate men trying to talk them out of the word of God. And Father, I say, let it be so. And Father, I ask that you would carry this message everywhere that, that a member of the remnant is and that it would minister to them and empower them in the kingdom. In Jesus' name.